Welcome to This is Concrete, a podcast where we speak with the people whose work revolves around concrete and coatings. Let's get to what you came for. Hello, Chad Gill here. I'm the host of the This is Concrete podcast, where I talk with leaders in facilities management, architecture, contracting, and more. This episode is brought to you by Concrete. Concrete is a concrete polishing and coatings company with nearly 20 years of experience working in commercial, industrial, and residential markets. So whether you need smooth transitions for warehouse traffic, show stop and lobby floor, or a seamless concrete accent wall, we can provide the skill and imagination you need to make your concrete uncommon. So visit us at thisisconcrete.com to learn more about Concrete today. We're also sponsored by Workforce Recon. Recon is a project tracking software that connects the office to the field crews. It is built with a field first mentality developed by contractors for contractors. It includes time and asset tracking, messaging, job documentation, and scheduling all in one place. So you can see what's going on in the field in real time. So if you're tired of finding out days later what happened, check us out at workforcerecon.com and uh, we can see what we can do. So joining me today is Sven Bailin. Is that correct? Did I get it right, Ben? Close enough. Sven Bailin. Uh, almost nobody gets it right. So Yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't want to be different. So, uh, but uh, Sven has uh, worked over, has over three decades of experience in designing, building, and fielding innovative systems for harsh and demanding environments. From space, that's right, space, to the Arctic. Since 2000, Sven has been on the faculty at Penn State, where he is the professor of engineering design, electrical engineering, and aerospace engineering, reflecting his belief that innovation happens at the interfaces of disciplines. Building the success of Penn State's Penn State Den at Mars team and NASA's 3D printed Mars Habitat Challenge, uh, Sven helped found the Additive Construction Laboratory at Penn State. His strong interest in seeing technologies and he has worked on and advanced within a university research environment to get into the real world, led him to co-found XHAB 3D, a company based in State College, Pennsylvania, that is revolutionizing construction with 3D concrete printing. Ben, thank you for joining me. I am uh, impressed and amazed and super excited. Um, and we could just, I mean, that, that's- Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see if you're still impressed after this interview, but uh, thank you very oh, much for, for having me on, so. Hey, you know, we can't all go to VMI, but, you know, I guess Penn State, it's not so bad. Did you graduate from Penn State or just- uh, Actually, I did. I did my undergraduate here at Penn State. Uh, I went off to another school uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, I'll <laughs> play on football Saturdays and uh, then came back here as faculty in 2000. Wow, that is that is fantastic. So, so how does it work? So, I mean, your your electric engineering design, electrical engineering, aerospace engineering that's that's pretty broad scope. Uh, and then uh, pulling it all together into concrete, which is civil engineering, and we really made fun of those guys a lot. Well, okay, so a few things. I think it maybe reflects the fact that people have a hard time figuring out where I actually belong at the university because I really fit in a lot of that interdisciplinary space, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, uh, because I like that interdisciplinary space, I'm always thinking about how do you pull together teams to kind of pursue really interesting ideas that maybe if you were siloed and only in a specific one specific field, you wouldn't pursue. So uh, another way of looking at it is I'm also a systems engineer. Um, I essentially um, I'm able to pull together systems, um, and that's one of the things that concrete 3D printing requires. I mean, it requires you to have a, a, a look at it from a systems viewpoint. Um, I often say that it, it goes from the micro scale, you're dealing with essentially the, the concrete chemistry and all those kinds of things to the macro scale, where you're actually, you know, building things at the building scale. So, you know, being able to look at things from the mi micro to the macro scale really involves um, a systems engineering lens. So maybe that's the way to think about me as a, as a systems engineer. There you go. So how is it that you, I know when we were kind of getting uh, introduced, you talked about lunar concrete and I definitely want to get to the 3D printing of concrete, but not before we, we can't skip over this lunar concrete. Well, sure. Um, so, you know, as my bio uh, stated, as you read there at the beginning, um, 
we participated as part of the uh, NASA Mars Habitat Challenge. Uh, so that's not lunar concrete, that's Martian concrete, um, or a way to try to build on Mars. And so uh, it's actually kind of an interesting origin story there. Um, I've been involved with space uh, pretty much my entire career since, since graduate school um, at Michigan uh, and have been involved and built satellites, um, built hardware that goes in, flown in space, et cetera. And I've always had an interest in space. There was an opportunity. Um, well, I, I should go back a little bit. I, I met a colleague of mine, uh, Jose Duarte, who had just arrived at Penn State. Um, he, he's uh, um, an architecture uh, professor and director of the Stuckman Institute for Design Computing. Um, and they were having a, a welcome party for him. And we talked and um, connected over some things. And he found out that I like to do things in space. And he says, you know, I've always wanted to, to design houses for Mars, to build houses on Mars. I'm like, okay, interesting. Um, and a little while later on, uh, NASA released their Mars Habitat Challenge. And I went back to him and I said, are you serious about this? Because here's an opportunity for us to actually kind of try to advance things there. So uh, we formed a team, uh, were uh, quite successful as part of that. Um, won a lot of... Um, phases of the, or uh, placed in a lot of phases of the design competition. Um, as part of that process, we pulled on a lot of other uh, faculty, et cetera. Um, the one in particular, um, uh, her name is Alexander Radlinska, um, that I've been working with since then on lunar concrete. Um, we've looked at essentially, are there interesting ways to, uh, to cure that concrete? So leveraging um, some work that she had been done previously. She's one of the, um, um, actually sent concrete samples to the space station to cure in microgravity. Um, that was actually how I met her, where um, she was interested in, in meeting with somebody that uh, had familiarity on how to pitch ideas to NASA. And uh, so I met with her and gave her sort of how to talk NASA speak and, and uh, she wrote the proposal was successful and has gotten a lot of visibility um, for the, the lunar concrete um, or the concrete in, in microgravity. So now we're looking at, okay, what can we do with lunar? We've got to build all these, these um, habitats and, and infrastructure on the moon. We want to be able to do in situ resource utilization and um, use the regolith. And so there are various different ways to use the regolith. Uh, one of those is actually to make it into a lunar concrete. What then regolith? regolith. So uh, we can't call it soil because soil has got organic matter and there's no um, soil on the moon. But you can think of regolith as lunar dirt, essentially the, the dust that you see everywhere on the moon. Um, and so that's one of the things that can be used for for lunar concrete. Uh, matter of fact, um, uh, you know, I have to I guess I have to wear a couple hats sometimes. Um, so I actually have for visualization here, here's my Penn State hat and here's my, my XHAB hat. So for conflict of interest things at the university, we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, an STTR, um, which is a small business technology transfer research grant uh, that um, is, it's essentially America's seed fund for, for startups, et cetera. Uh, requires uh, working with a, a, um, a a research institution like Penn State, a small company working with them, and you can get some uh, research funding. We recently just were awarded uh, a NASA STTR, uh, so company XHAB 3D working with uh, Penn State um, to pursue essentially looking at can microwave energy be used for curing of lunar concrete? So as opposed to providing thermal energy, can we microwave it and there's actually some very interesting preliminary work um, that that shows that there's there's really some potential in that. So, anyway, that's uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what those things uh, are related to sort of lunar concrete and eventually hopefully a lunar lunar 3D printing of, of lunar concrete. Those those are really interesting. Those um, I learned about those um, grants and stuff. Um, I did um, a NASA open house. Gosh, this must have been like 2002 or something like that. I mean, it's uh, the Kennedy Space Center. And it was amazing because, you know, we, Vegetarius actually saw the first time I'd ever seen a 3D printer. Um, it was even, it was probably like in 99. I mean, it was, it was pretty early. And um, 
you know, and, and they were building a biped remote robot and stuff like that. And, and they were saying that they would license, I think, some of the solar film on glasses. Tang, I think some of those other things. Tang, are these are all uh, NASA, uh, NASA sort of commercialization sec, um, yeah. successes. So, you know, actually NASA, um, a lot of its technology is transferred at, out. So sort of hand um, handheld uh, battery operated power tools. You know, those were designed, the battery packs and figuring out how to make those things handheld. That was all because NASA needed to be able to, to, you know, work outside the space station or work on the space shuttle without cords and wires and those kinds of things. You can go on and on and on about the different uh, technologies that, that NASA has catalyzed uh, essentially as part of their innovation infrastructure. And, you know, that's also one of the things that we find is, yeah, you know, we're, we're looking at how do you print houses on Mars or how do you look at um, you know, curing of lunar concrete with microwaves, but they all have applications here on Earth. Um, so the technologies that we develop to be able to autonomously print on Mars, well, we want autonomous 3D concrete printers here on Earth, um, particularly as we're looking at going into expeditionary in, um, environments or, you know, the military is very interested in that to be able to build structures in places where that are, you know, contested um, to keep um, keep the soldiers out of harm's way, essentially. Um, same thing with microwave curing of lunar concrete. There's some techniques that we maybe can use um, down here on Earth uh, for this, you know, utilizing the technologies that we develop uh, as part of this NASA process. And NASA actually likes that. They actually ask specifically, hey, this is for space, but how could you also use this on Earth? Because they know that, you know, at least currently, um, the space applications may be um, a less... Of a, of a total market opportunity than what we have here on earth. That is fantastic. So what is the binder when you're doing lunar concrete and you're using regolith, what is the binder? What's holding it together? Well, the regolith itself is the binder essentially. Um, it, it is reactive. Um, the idea is that you're able to uh, release water. You can also do that through a microwave process um, and that water reacts uh, with the binder. So here you're beginning to get a little bit into the to the chemistry of that process. And I know just enough to make uh, make myself dangerous in this area, um, but I've learned enough to, to understand that process, yes. So with XHAB 3D, how close are we, or how, how, how close are you to where you can really truly 3D print structural components and, or even a whole house? I mean, we see, you, you see YouTube videos of them, but you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. You know, How's how's that progressing for you guys? Well, it's progressing really, really well. I mean, we've we've printed, um, um, you know, uh, portions of walls, and we're working towards our first full print. Um, we have several opportunities coming up um, that we're capitalizing on to to do that. Um, but we're this is near term for us. Um, something that we are going to have to be able to demonstrate pretty soon. Um, uh, so you know, I would say that. You know we're we're well we're well along our way um, as part of that. I would also say that you know there's a, a number of different ways that concrete three D printing can happen. There's a, a bunch of companies out there that have pursued a gantry based approach. Uh, what we do at XHAB three D is um, a robotic arm uh, approach, and we put that on uh, tank treads so that it's mobile um, and that can be expeditionary. We can move it, you know, in behind a, a building if that's possible or if that's necessary. Uh, we can move it onto a job site. Uh, we can work out in the, in the you know, uh, rural areas. All those kinds of things are, are what we think make our product unique. Yeah. And so you're printing walls, I guess, within the radius of whatever that arm would fit. And then you're just going to add, you know, do additives. So you're not you're not printing like what you see the gantries where you're printing an entire square. You're going to break it into components and then print your way around. Yeah, there's, you're absolutely right. So depending on the size of the structure, um, our robot, our mobile um, system will essentially move to print the next uh, portion. Um, the, you know, with with proper design, you essentially can place the those different uh, the, when you move from one to the other. You know that can happen at the say. A door jam, or there'll be a, a wall uh, seam there, et cetera. But uh, I don't think that there's really any concerns with being able to print larger structures using our our methodology. 
why 3D print? Like, what is the what is the draw on it? So there's a number of drives behind 3D concrete printing. Um, so one of those is that, uh, you know, the traditional poured concrete method is extremely wasteful, um, particularly with respect to, you know, building the formwork and then and then pouring the concrete into that. And then typically that formwork is is removed and thrown away. Essentially, maybe it might be used again, you know, once or twice, et cetera, but, but typically. And so, you know, we've seen estimates of the cost of anywhere between 40 and 60 percent of the cost of, of uh, uh, building something out of concrete is just developing that formwork. Uh, the other thing about that is that there's significant uh, waste of time and cost um, uh, in terms of personnel that have to be able to build all that formwork, et cetera. The thing about concrete printing is you put down the concrete exactly where you need it and um, it cures or at least sets up uh, so that it's stiff enough that you can add the next layer onto it and you don't have to do anything with formwork. The other thing about um, removing the need for formwork is typically we're bound by the, um, the, 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 the boundary conditions of the formwork. And that is that they're typically straight pieces of wood, you know, large pieces of, of plywood, et cetera. So we get square walls and square corners and things like that. Um, if you want to do something more complicated, it's obviously much, much more expensive to do that. Uh, whereas with concrete printing, you get complexity for free. There's some other very, very interesting things about concrete printing. Um, they include things like, well, um, just like with uh, other 3D printers, you can change the characteristic or change the type of concrete voxel by voxel, essentially volume unit by volume unit as you go along. And you can provide stronger concrete where the strength needs to happen. You can provide concrete that has more insulative capabilities, but might be less strong where you need the insulation, et cetera. Um, we're actually working as part of XHAB 3D in tandem again with Penn State uh, on a DARPA uh, S SBIR, and we just got awarded a phase two SBIR to build artificial reefs, essentially, um, to help with coastal erosion. Um, and what DARPA is, uh, interested in, and so DARPA is only interested in things that usually require two or three miracles. Um, they only do things that are, are DARPA hard, as they say. Um, and, you know, they've had a few successes. Uh, you might have heard of something called the internet. Uh, yeah. Well, that's one of their successes, you know, handheld GPS receivers. That's another one of their successes, et cetera. So that's ways that DARPA kind of catalyzes innovation. Well, they only do the hard stuff. And so they wanted to see, you know, could companies provide not just carbon negative, but carbon neutral concrete to be able to build these artificial reefs. And that's something that we're able to demonstrate through what we call functionally grading. So we've got areas that are strong. We can have areas um, and, and the strong means that it might not be as carbon neutral, but we can add some other areas where we have a different formulation where we just dump all kinds of, of uh, uh, carbon and, and uh, uh, organic matter into that to make that more carbon neutral. Um, these are all the kinds of things that we can do with concrete 3D printing that are just not going to be possible uh, with the normal way of sort of poured concrete. Man, that is crazy. I uh, just, um, and, and, you know, watching it, um, watching it develop over time. I mean, like I said, I mean, I would think it starts easy with, you know, things like, you know, retaining walls or fountains and things, like, you know, low level type of things, but then to get up into being able to print a foundation. I mean, like I said, you're, you're printing just where you need it, only where you need it, lower labor cost. And then it's kind of like a batch mixer of concrete too. You know, the advantage is you make how much concrete you need. Right. Exactly. Are you, is it, are you pumping? Is it, is the mix, um, is it an aggregate mix? Is it really just a grout or, or does it just vary? It varies. I mean, right now um, we are printing mostly what the concrete world will refer to as a grout. Um, we're limited to about three eighths of an inch aggregate right now. Um, there is a need to to go to to larger aggregates. Um, right now, we have a constant displacement pump. Um, we we have used both at the university and in the company, uh, what are known as MTech pumps, et cetera. Um, we're moving towards you know some different types of pumps that essentially allow us to uh, move up in aggregate size, and that would typically, as opposed to a constant displacement pump like the MTEX, would re require essentially piston pumps uh, to be able to do that. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, it, that would make sense. I mean, it's a lot of wear and tear going through those hoses. Absolutely. You Not just the hoses, but the the um the constant displacement pump, right? I mean, it, that that's that's uh, not much space in there to be able to provide the pressure to be able to pump through the hoses. And it's a lot of pressure. I mean, you start pushing concrete up stories, you know, it that that is a tremendous amount of pressure, which we're already doing that for mm -hmm. pump towers and stuff like that. But then to be able to place it, you know, you gotta let that pressure off as well. Right. Um well, man, that is uh, that is super interesting. I definitely wish you luck. Um, that's you know, we get it here quick so we can make money off of it. You know, <laughs> that's, uh, well, and that's you know, that's the other thing I, uh, I should say about XHab. Um, you know, we're focused on building the the printers essentially, so designing and building the printers, um, providing that to the industry. So we're not uh, interested in you know being the general contractor, the builder on site. And I think that's another differentiation between um, XHAB 3D and some of the other companies that you see out there that also want to be the, the builder. Um, our, our idea is to provide essentially these mobile expeditionary concrete printers into the market such that others can go and build and use them in all kinds of different ways. Yeah, ways you probably never intended if I know the contractors are involved. <laughs> well, and that that's good. I mean, we, you know, we want to hear you know, all kinds of different applications that we can, you know, we can use them for in market spaces that we can go into. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think when first 3D printers, you know, polymer 3D printers were coming out, people really had no idea of all the different places that people would start 3D printing stuff for, or, or um, you know, uh, then they moved into metal 3D printers. And, you know, now they're even getting to be where they're used all the time for production on just, you know, parts. Um, um, so yeah, I, I think the same thing will happen um, with the concrete 3D printers. It'll it'll be you know a tool that every contractor is going to have one or more of and be able to use that on site, just like they've got you know diggers and, and backhoes and and you know everything else that they, that they would have on site. Oh yeah, no, I mean I could see it an easy situation where you know you start out building a printer that's kind of you know, with the intent of printing vertical walls, and the next thing you know you're printing. You know, you're printing artificial reefs, you know, so I mean, concrete you know. trusses or right, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. you know, things where you're like, yeah, sure, it'll do that. I just didn't plan for it. You know, that's, right. the, that's the world of innovation. Uh, but no, that, that is awesome. Well, you know, it sounds like um, it sounds like you're really hating your job. So I feel for you. That's uh, that's pretty amazing stuff you've got going and, uh, and a good place to be doing it, too. Uh, but, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Um I feel like we definitely ought to follow up with you. Uh, I don't know if 15 minutes is enough for another breakthrough or not, but definitely somewhere probably next year, it'll be pretty interesting to see how far you come. Happy to happy to meet again. Uh, we've got all kinds of cool things that are going to be happening this year. Um, and so it would be certainly great to, to update you um, next year or or even earlier. So is there, I know um, XHAB 3D, so that's XHAB3D.com for your 3D printers. And then That's if somebody wants to kind of learn more about the research you're doing, and uh, if you're like me and you're like, man, I got to learn about this lunar concrete, where can we uh, kind of check that out? So the, the lab at the university is called the Additive Construction Lab or ADCON Lab. So if you just Google Additive Construction Lab Penn State, um, you'll, you'll find the URL for that. Fantastic. Sven, I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time with us. And uh, we know we look forward to seeing some more of what you, what you guys develop. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Great. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to This is Concrete. We look forward to you joining us next time. Be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.